volunteer once I'm inspired. So we're, uh, but at the same time, we're kind of used to it. Good afternoon. We'll uh, going to start our panel here. Um, 
Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, let me just make some introductions and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. Um, we're here to talk about Christian citizenship at a crossroad. Um, some reflections on uh, Roe v. Wade, the nature of abortion, Christian witness in the uh, public marketplace of ideas, and, and so on. And with me today, Dr. Andrew Harris, Dr. Mark Clawson, and Dr. Joshua Kira. Please welcome our panel. I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Gilhooley. I'm just going to ask questions. Uh, we're going to talk about some ideas and kind of get it going for about half an hour or so, and at which point I'll turn it over to uh, questions from the floor. Um, there is a microphone here on a stand, so when it comes time for questions, if you'd come to the microphone to, uh, to make your uh, question known, that'd be great. And you can address well, a member of the panel or the whole panel, either way, and we'll kind of go from there. Um, Dr. Klaassen, I'd like to start with you if I could. I wondered if you could kind of set us up a little with some background on the, uh, the history of legal precedents and so on regarding Roe v. Wade and abortion, kind of where we stand are, and particularly as the Supreme Court is going to be making some decisions uh, come the summer. As I do that, I'd kind of like to go back further even than Roe versus Wade, uh, way back into the early church, uh, if I could, um, particularly after the, after the year 313 when Christianity was a tolerated religion and kind of look at how law dealt with abortion then. Um, and <clears throat> you see uh, pretty much a consistent approach to the legal um, aspect of abortion from 313 onward. Um, basically, it was illegal, uh, except there were, once in a while, there were some exceptions, depending on the time period. Um, you could have an abortion, if it was accidental, that would not be um, prosecuted, if it was Deliberate, it would be prosecuted. It wasn't always, though, the punishment wasn't always capital punishment, although sometimes it was under law uh, for the woman and for the person who, commit, who, who performed the abortion, uh, interestingly enough. Um, but the, they used the term formation. If the fetus was formed, then the abortion, the deliberate abortion was punishable uh, by the maximum penalty. If it was unformed, and that, that sort of depend, uh, the, the idea of formed and unformed was a certain time period in which the, the, the unborn baby was, uh, became alive, so to speak. Ensouled is a better word to say it, I think. Uh, and that could be anywhere between uh, 50 and 80 days, so they varied among each other. Come into the later period, the Reformation, the Reformers picked up on the early church and medieval views on the legality of abortion. So wherever the state and church were together, they also uh, outlawed abortion. Um, there was a time period when there was sort of a less of an interest in it, though the laws were still on the books. It wasn't very much prosecuted for a while until the later 1800s in the United States, and then the interest picked up again uh, in punishing abortion, um, punishing those who performed the abortion in particular. And then uh, we, we see sort of a lull again uh, from 1900 to about the 19, late 60s, and then we begin to see some agitation from those who want to take the abortion situations or cases to actual courts in the United States. So we get Roe versus Wade as the first one of these in 1973, and you probably already know about Roe versus Wade. I'll just quickly mention it. Um, it's, it was the right of abortion granted based on the, the, the understood right of privacy, which had already been um, derived from, a, from previous case law, such as Griswold versus Connecticut. Uh, of course, the right of privacy is not specifically stated in the Constitution, but the right of privacy was the one invoked by the court to grant the abortion right. And then the court, of course, dabbled with a few other issues related to that. When does the state have an interest in protecting the unborn child, and when does the state not have an interest, uh, dividing into trimesters doing that? Uh, and then the same day that case was divided or, or decided, uh, Doe versus Bolton was also decided by the Supreme Court, and that um, further widened the scope of abortion by saying an abortion could be granted for anything having to do with the mother's health, defined extremely broadly, right? Uh, then we have a few cases after that, Casey, the Casey case from Pennsylvania, 1992, which uh, continued the abortion trend of the Supreme Court up to that point, but did allow a bit of limitation, and since 1992, the courts have have allowed the abortion right to be nibbled at the edges. Uh, they've never fully over, over, overturned Roe versus Wade. Uh, there may be this year that possibility. 
with the Mississippi case, um, which is, is already been is, is already been argued before the court and will be decided probably in June of this year, and then the uh, case from Texas, which has been argued too, and will be decided probably in June this year. That was uh, Senate Bill Eight, uh, which set up an elaborate procedure to prohibit abortion, um, which we can talk about later on. But that's where we stand now, legally speaking. Abortion rights exist in the United States, most other places in the world too, but we're speaking specifically of the United States, but they are more restricted than they were in Roe versus Wade in 1973. So uh, I'll just stop there and allow things to go on. Okay, thanks very much. Dr. Kira, I'd like to uh, turn to you in light of that. There's a, a kind of a, a long history here where there's some uh, Christian precedent for what we at one time called the Christian West, where there's kind of a resemblance of a certain kind between certain aspects of natural law, legal theory, Christian ethic and morality and so on. And Christians could have felt in many cases, at least as represented in law, uh, that some of our values were being encoded and kind of protected by government structures and so forth. Not perfectly, but present in a certain kind of way. In the world we find ourselves in now, it seems like many things that Christians would take for granted, that would be just a place we'd feel at home ethically and so forth. Increasingly, we don't have a cultural ascendancy on some of those matters or the kind of um, uh, height that we once did. And we find ourselves in arguing for minority positions for things that strike us as just maybe obvious. Um, what can you say to us about how to navigate that kind of ethical divide? Yeah. So. We look like we're in a society that is <clears throat> becoming more antagonistic to the Christian perspective. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, I, I think a couple things that are important is um, we have to think about why that's difficult for us. Because there's actually many reasons why it could be difficult for some of them, for some of us, some of them being good and some of them I don't think are actually that significant. I, I think some people are afraid that Christians don't have as much of an influence because of our goal in just trying to keep uh, a certain uh, base level morality in our society. And I think that's a good reason to be concerned about our, our influence. But I think other people don't like the fact that we don't have as much influence because it may make it uncomfortable for us to hold Christian positions. Or uh, maybe because we think that uh, Christianity is going to be put forth by us using governmental means in some respects. Like we think the government is going to be what helps us to do something very Christian. I think both of those are actually very concerning to me. Uh, I think we need to think uh, or, or realize that even historically, when Christians have been persecuted, that doesn't stop the gospel. and That doesn't stop church, uh, church ministry. And in some places, that's actually better for the gospel. Um, and in, in a worldwide sense, I think we have to realize that there's a certain opportunity here because People seeing America as a Christian nation has allowed people to say, when America makes a mistake, that's the Christian's fault. And the disassociation of us with, uh, the, uh, with kind of power within the government comes at a cost because we can't protect morality as well in America, but it also gives us a certain uh, possibility, which is uh, the church will no longer be blamed as often for mistakes that politicians make. And so we have to think that as, as, as something that we can use uh, for the service of God's glory. But in terms of kind of in a more hostile society, I think this means a couple things. One is our lives are going to have to very well reflect what we believe because people are now looking for reasons to discount what we say. And so that means like our lives of loving people are going to be significant now to getting standing because we used to have standing simply because Christianity was so dominant in America that standing is going to, to some degree, be lost. And so one of the ways that we're going to keep standing is just by ministering well, loving people within the church, serving people well, being careful on the way that we use rhetoric with people, um, thinking about how we can minister. Um, I think those are going to be significant to us. I think it also means that it's going to require us to, to take a certain type of boldness, willing, uh, I think in a lot of ways, counting the cost of what it's going to mean to be a Christian in this age. So we're going to have to say hard things, and some people are not going to like us for it. And we have to understand uh, that that is just the way that the world is. I mean, when, before Christ left this earth, when he talked to his disciples in the Upper Room Discourse, he makes it very clear the world will not like them. And so we have to understand that that's the direction that this world's headed. And in that, we have to be more prepared, 
I think, to love our enemies than we normally would be because it's just going to get more difficult. In, in terms of just engagement, I think it means that we need to be very well educated on the topic because um, I think there's a tendency for Christians to look at the world and say, you're immoral. And the world to say to Christians, well, you're stupid. And the, the danger is sometimes we're both right. Do you see what I'm saying? And that's going to be very hard for us to minister well if people think, oh, you haven't thought about this. If I know more than someone, they're forced to listen to me in a lot of ways. And so I, I think we have to be really enga engaged with the topic. We need to be re reading the newspapers, even in this bubble of Cedarville, and then thinking about it clearly in the ethical issues so that we can proclaim a moral position, def defend Christianity well, and then minister in a context that is not conducive to Christianity any longer. So I think this is interesting. You're saying that one of the uh, potential uh, upsides of a kind of lack of uh, Christian ascendancy is just that uh, it forces us to, into a position where we have to take a real opportunity to be serious about what we think about matters and how we're going to talk about matters. Whereas if we had legal instruments kind of in our favor, we could be kind of lazy with our witness in that respect. And uh, as a consequence, we begin to talk in a certain kind of way that may not always may not always capture what's best in our thinking or frankly be persuasive to people that don't share kind of our values and our setting. Um, in, in light of that, I wonder if you might give us, a, give us some insights on what we should think about advocacy or the rhetoric of the, the movement yeah. and how we should talk about these things as Christians. Well, well, I want to begin by saying that I had to check my watch because I couldn't believe that they were giving the communication guy over half of the time allotted for opening comments. <laughs> But I'm going to do my best to try not to use that whole time. Uh, I, I want to take a, a kind of a, a different perspective uh, by talking um, about this in terms of what you can do right now. Um, first of all, we have to change our mindset. Um, since, since the early 70s and going all the way into the early 90s, with these major watershed cases in the Supreme Court, you're talking about Christians on this topic being in a constant state of crisis. And through the very good work of many, many advocates at pregnancy, uh, pregnancy health centers and uh, just special speak speakers going across the nation, uh, people working in our legislatures, and, and, and government, uh, we're finally to a point where there's a possibility this summer that Roe versus Wade could be overturned. Now, whether or not it does, that's another thing, but just the fact that this was a possibility, I think if you asked any of these gentlemen up here, is it possible that we see the overturn of Roe versus Wade in this decade, if, we, if we'd asked that five years ago, I, I, I won't speak for them, but I know I would say, hey, you just got to get used to it. Roe versus the Wade is the way it is, and it's going to be that way for a long time. So to see the kind of progress that, is, that has happened over the last, uh, really just the last decade on this topic, and maybe even we might say um, the last just five years on this particular topic is, is absolutely amazing. But that reminds us that reminds us that we have to go beyond the crisis, and we have to start thinking institutionally again. And that's what we're not doing enough of right now. So when you think about the idea of an abortion, we think mainly about the crisis. We think about the woman who's showing up to the health clinic and the men and women at that clinic who are doing the very excellent work of trying to dissuade her from killing her child. But then we forget, we forget that this is an institutional problem that started way before that moment. You have the disintegration of the family. You have the, um, you have the cheapening of sex. You have a, a culture that no longer has a true uh, ethical mooring. And if we're going to permanently end abortion, 
we have to start thinking about all the institutions that lead up to an abortion. So our vision has to be cast much bigger than just we have to, we have to tell people that abortion is bad. Yes, abortion is bad, but it is a symptom. It's not the root cause of the problem. So that's one thing that we can start doing is just start thinking, okay, in my, I've got all kinds of majors here, I'm sure. In my major, in my institution that I'm a part of, how can I start changing the culture of the institutions I'm a part of to make them institutions that, that uh, have a culture of life and value of life? And that's in government, it's in medicine, it's in sciences, it's in the humanities. We have to change that scope to realize that we're all a part of this. Secondly, you can start changing terms right now. Like one of the things that we teach uh, in the communication department when we're talking about argumentation is that uh, the first thing you have to do is define terms. It's the very first thing you have to do. In fact, in academic debate, many debate is won or lost based solely on how you define the terms in the very first speech, in a series of eight speeches. And it's the same in real life. I want to encourage you today, start talking about the abortion issue in Christian terms. One thing you can do, I want to encourage you to never ever call a baby a fetus again. Never again. It's a baby when it's not the termination of a fetus, it's the death of a child. It's the killing of a child. And that's hard because some people are going to push back on you against that, and you're going to have to use those terms in a spirit of, of grace and of love. But you've got to use the right terms. Don't let the opposition set the terms for you. And then thirdly, start thinking about, uh, about abortion and life in terms of what we're doing right now, in terms of education. Many of you, um, maybe some, some, some in our audience, I, I know I probably already have children. My children are with uh, me today with my, my wonderful wife up there, all five of my kids. Uh, and some of you are going to have kids in the future. When you are training them, don't, don't forget in getting the math and the science that are vital to their education, that you also need to train them in a moral ethic. Don't forget that reading the Word of God on a daily basis with your family is a part of their education. And this is something that if you go 100 years back, everybody knew. Everybody took it for granted. But because we stopped thinking institutionally about about what education should be and the where edu how education leads not just to a job but to uh, to a good job but hopefully to also living a good life we have forgotten that this is not just something you do on sunday it's something you do every single day of the week with your children with one another education is a part of it you know advocacy ed uh, communication is the big thing today in the communication world um, you can, you can Google it, you can put in, where can I get an advocacy communication degree? And you're going to get all kinds of schools popping up that are going to teach you how to advocate for abortion. There is, I, 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 I challenge you to find a school other than Cedarville University that has taken the institutional step not the crisis step, but the institutional step to say, we are going to actually begin educating on this. And I, I do have a slide. I have to get up and show everybody my slide here. Um, our, our Vice President for Academics Office has uh, created the Defending Life Summer Institute. And this is the, the, only, um, the only regionally accredited program of its kind that I know of. If you know of another one, please let me know because I want to meet the people in that, in that uh, program. But uh, we I have partnered with Scott Klusendorf of the Life Training Institute and Mark Newman of Speaker for Life and also John Enzor of Passion Life in order to offer um, a series of classes that 
teach you how to the, teach you the arguments about abortion, like for abortion, against abortion, for life, against life, and then a class to teach you how to actually deliver that message with that grace and love that we've talked about. And we're offering those for the first time this summer. Uh, I encourage you to think about those. You can go to cedarville.edu, Defending Life. But we've got to start thinking about these things as institutions, not just as individuals in crisis. And that's how you create a movement in an advocacy sense. Yeah, so I think this is an interesting point. We've heard, you know, there's a kind of relationship between uh, church and state through much of history that allowed us maybe to uh, piggyback on Christian morality as encoded in the laws that governed everyone as a kind of sense of the rule of law, kind of Christian by proxy of being a member of the state. And as that's kind of eroded in many cases, uh, we've heard that you're going to have to be more clear about what you think and how you want to advocate, not just in an individual life, uh, but also as the, the people of God, the people who are tasked with trying to present Christ's way of doing things uh, in, a, in a public setting. And um, that can be very challenging. So it seems like one of the key things we're hearing here is that uh, there has to be some element of bravery. And that bravery comes from a real conviction, not just that one is right, but that what you're promoting is good and hence worth talking about and hence uh, worth promoting something that it is worth celebrating. Um, I think that is another hurdle that I've seen where there's occasion that when people are not going to like what we're saying, Dr. Kira, that you may sometimes think, what's the right way to go about this so that I could overcome that? Uh, could you give us some insight on how to think about that issue? I'm going to speak to somebody. I know, perhaps, that they're going to be unhappy with what I'm saying. Maybe I've done some work to get prepared on the arguments and so forth, but I really want to have a witness that says I'm coming about this because I believe that it's good. <clears throat> yeah, uh, part of it depends on the relationship. If, if this is going to be a long-term relationship, then you play long game, right? So it's interesting, when Christ does his gospel preaching, he doesn't always come guns blaring. <laughs> Sometimes he just heals people and lets them come back. And so, I, which means that he has a certain wisdom, right? He talks about the certain shrewdness that we have in ministry. And so I think if I know I'm going to have a long-term relationship with a person, then I'm going to, to some degree, build up relational capital with them, right? If I'm caring for someone else, right? If I'm bringing another uh, family meals, uh, being good to their children, then it's much harder for them to take what I say with anger when I disagree with them, right? Uh, there's other times where it's just not going to happen. Other times it's going to be you meet someone, this is the discussion that ends up happening, and uh, you know that people are going to be angry. I think the big keys, one is um, you need to have a lot of self-control in what you do. When you don't have self-control, you usually argue poorly, and it could also make your life not reflect what you actually believe. And that's going to, it, it, the difficulty, what we ha difficulty we have is even if you have the best argument, if someone thinks you're a horrible person, they're still not going to listen to you. Right? If you're super offensive, it really doesn't matter how good your argument is. Like in academia, like you'll have PhDs who write in journal articles and they're awful to each other and people are like, whatever. Because they just, all they care about is the argument. But when you're talking to an actual person on the street, it's impossible for them to separate the persuasiveness of your argument from the persuasiveness of you as a person before them. And so you have to be very, I think, a lot more self-control in the way that you deal with them. Two, I think you make simple arguments. You don't pretend like you know more than you do. You make the arguments you can make. And if you don't know things, then you tell them you're going to find out for them because that gives you an opportunity, an excuse to continue the relationship and to continue work on, on gospel ministry. Um, and, and I think the, uh, the last thing uh, you want to think about is you want to be careful because you do not know the experience of the person who you're talking to. You see that? I, I think some people have very elevated rhetoric on abortion Christians have, uh, not realizing that there's people in the room that have had an abortion. Like there's a pretty reasonable chance that in a room this big that someone has had, an, had one, even here at Cedarville. And there's definitely girls who at this university have had abortions. And so we have to be careful with the way that you elevate rhetoric, because if you just come in and say, well, uh, all abortions murder. All, is all abortion killing and the death of a child? Yeah. But when you say abortions murder, you're talking about an intention of an individual. And if they had an abortion 
we don't know the situation they're in. It's going to be very hard for you to minister if you're not careful in that case. Um, I, I've known times in which, like in, in L.A., um, counselors at schools can tell an individual how to get an abortion, advocate for having an abortion, and never alert the parents, which means there's going to be girls who are 12 years old who are told that they should have an abortion, that there's no problem ethically with someone they trust for it, that's a different position than someone else who's like, well, I, I, would, like to be, I, I would like to have no responsibilities for promiscuity. Th those are different cases. <laughs> Do you see that? And so you have to be careful because you don't know the experience of the individual you're talking to, so you want to be very measured in the way that you're putting forth. And the type of rhetoric needs to be, like we said, biblical rhetoric. This is a death and it is a tragedy, and it is immoral to do it. But not everybody is at the same fault when this event occurs. And so we have to be very careful in the way that we, we, we uh, proceed. I like the idea that if you're going to uh, be prepared to engage in certain kinds of things, it would really benefit you to learn the arguments, to benefit you to have a vocabulary and a grammar to kind of talk about an issue cogently, intelligently. But part of that equipping is it, uh, it gives you a toolbox and then you can decide which tool to use. It isn't necessarily the case that you just have to dump the whole toolbox on somebody, you know, the first time that you encounter them. And I think likewise, a way to think about that is when we're advocating for things, when we're arguing, you're not just facing an argument when you look at someone else in the face, you're facing a person. So you actually have to address the person and not just address the argument. Now, if you have no arguments, you might have a hard time addressing the person. <laughs> But if all you had was kind of, uh, you know, heat, it would be really hard to recognize that you're trying to persuade someone and not just try to make a case that's just sort of out there and, and in containing its own integrity. Can I just speak a little bit to Please that? Please do. Yeah, this is, this is where I want to go a little further and talk about the limitations of the legal issues in abortion. Um, most of us are not going to be before a court arguing an abortion case. Uh, and in fact, Probably, and I'm going to disprove Andrew's position here, um, I don't think uh, Roe versus Wade is going to be overturned. Oh, I um, at least not anytime soon. However, it may be modified, which is pretty important. But even so, abortion is still going to be with us. So that takes us back to the issue of how, really how crucial is the legal argument, are the legal arguments versus the other strategies that you two guys have talked about. All right? These are the things that we're really going to have to deal with on the ground every day, every week, every month, every year, year in, year out. Whereas the legal arguments come up once in a while, the court modifies abortion rights somewhat, they never really go all the way, are they going to, how far are they going to go? This is, I'm guessing this is probably going to last for uh, decades to come at least. And so it's our, it's our responsibility as Christians to address these issues as believers, um, winsomely, civilly, graciously, accurately, right? And with the right words to use, uh, even as other people make arguments, which are legitimate. I'm not, I don't want to discount the legitimacy of arguing a case before the court. But you know, even if the court did overturn Roe versus, versus Wade, it's still not gonna stop abortion. So the real issue is the moral issue behind it all. Yeah, so it seems like a, a, a helpful way we've been trying to think about this is, you know, uh, we can talk about this particular moment as being at a crossroad, a crossroad of changing opinions on abortion and legality and so forth, but advocacy for, for life, for the value of the family, uh, for Christian values, is not something that we stop whenever the laws sort of reflect the values that we want. It's still something we advocate with, with our, our words, the way we relate to each other, with the whole of our lives. Yeah, uh, it's just, just picking up off of what Dr. Clausen said. Um, I think the, 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 point, the, the, the point here is, is not, is Roe versus Wade going to get overturned or not? The, the point, I think, is that there, either way, there is still going to be plenty of work that needs to be done. Uh, so let's assume, best case scenario, Roe versus Wade is completely struck down. It is no longer seen as precedent for the land. Yay! Now you have 50 battles because each state will then be allowed to create their own rules about abortion. Let's say you were able to win all 50 of those battles. Yay! People are still going to have babies. 
What do you do then? What do you do? You, how, do, do, you, do you try to adopt all of them? I, I don't know that that's the answer. Uh, because because the, 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 wim, the women who, right now, who, who are seeking abortions, and if there was no abortion to be, to be had, would then have the babies, in a way, they kind of need adopting too. They don't have communities that they are welcomed in. And there's one thing that we know about the church is that women do not feel comfortable, even years after the fact, they do not feel comfortable telling people in their church that they have had an abortion. Because right now, and you can, you can decide what the reason is, I'm just telling you the facts, there is, there is not an environment conducive to talking about the abortion you had in our church today. It's not there. So we have, to, we have to think about this, not in terms of hanging everything on a single case, but in how we create a world in which life is valued again, both the life of the baby and the life of the mother, because, and I know those are two different ideas, one is about living and, bre about living and breathing, and the other is about, is about having a full spiritual life, and I'm not trying to equivocate, but both of those are important if we are to have a true doctrine of life. Okay, with that, I'd like to uh, open it up to the audience if anybody has a question for the panel. We've got uh, the microphone on the stand here. If you'd like to come down, we'd be happy to take some interaction. You can ask a question to someone on the panel uh, in particular, or you could address the whole panel. So I know a girl here, and she's had an abortion, um, and I found out maybe like a year ago, and she had an abortion like two years ago, um, and I found out that she, I was posting a lot of stuff on social media about abortion, how it was wrong, and stuff like that, um, and found out that it really hurt her. Um, so how do I address, um, I don't really know what the question is, uh, like how do I address her, how do I, do I continue to advocate for pro-life on my social media, or do I stop, or what does that look like, I guess? <clears throat> Why don't you start? Uh, yeah, so um, we just have to be careful on social media in general, I think. We just have to be careful. Um, <laughs> we use social media at this university, but I will just say this. I don't know of anyone who has gone on social media and that's made them a better person. True everywhere. I think it can make you the same. If you're doing well, if you're a Christian, you could be the same person. But I don't think anybody's like, I get on there and then I become better. So we have to be, care be very careful of it. And I think we just don't pay attention to a lot of what it tries to do. So I think one is we've got to be careful with social media in general. I think the way that I approach it is the way that we approach everybody, which is the grace of Christ overcomes all human frailties and failures. Everyone. Which means that even if you do believe that she's done something wrong, as I would, that does not mean that she can't be forgiven by the blood of Christ, because I've been forgiven by the blood, and you have, and there's been murderers like Paul and, and David. There's been adulterer. David's an adulterer. They've been forgiven by God, and, we, and, and those aren't, I think, in the same area of what she's done, um, and so I, I think I would want to approach her by kind of ap approaching preaching grace. I think when we do social media, I just, one is I want to think, does my social media actually do something when I advocate, advocate for these things? Like, if it brings up good discussions with other people, that sounds good. If it's just like, I'm just going to go out there, like sometimes, um, so my, uh, my son who is, uh, he is very perceptive, uh, he's 11 years old. Uh, we were talking about bumper stickers. And he's like, hey, bumper stickers are kind of like Twitter for old people. And I'm like, that is very true. Uh, but like a lot of people go on Twitter and you, only, you don't have a place to build an argument. You have a place to blast people or try to own someone. And that's what you're doing it for. And so uh, if I'm going to be able to use social media to actually develop conversations with people, that seems to be what I'm going to try to do. 
What I am probably not gonna do is try to go on there to just blast people, because I think that's actually not gonna lead me to the type of discussions that will actually change someone's mind. So it doesn't mean that social media is like, okay, I'm done with it, it but it means that social media, the way that we'd actually use social media to do something, like, I don't care how many followers each of you have, no one's gonna have 50,000 followers, well, maybe, I don't, I don't think so, where it's gonna actually make a difference if, you're, if you just blast someone. With the people who do follow you, you could say things that would say, hey, let's talk about this. And that might be the best use of it. And that's gonna be, I think, the way that you'd wanna move your, your usage of social media. So I think preach grace, preach forgiveness, and two, it might just be even apologies, because if you did, like, I don't know what you did, but it's like if you did something that you think was probably too bombastic, there might be times that we need to apologize. I apologize to my kids all the time because I say things in the heat of the moment that I shouldn't say. And so um, it might be ask forgiveness, preach a gospel of grace, and then use social media not as a way to make the argument, but as a way to discuss so that at eventually you can get to a point where you can actually make an argument. You know, Dr. Kira, I think, I think the reason, one of the reasons for that is that you can't, you cannot have an opportunity for the full persuasive package mm -hmm. on social media. It's just not possible. You can get the, the logos, the intellectual content, the facts and the arguments. You can get plenty of pathos, plenty of emotion on social media, but you cannot get the ethos. You cannot get the testimony of your life because by nature, any, any shadow of a life that you put up on social media is going to be incomplete and it's never going to be the full reality of who you are. You know, like, like my wife and I, we use social media to post pictures of our kids and to keep up with our friends. That's like the only reason that we use social media. We never argue with social media. And even then, like I don't post pictures, you know, of like the bad times I'm having at my house. I'm not like, hey everybody, I was really mean to my kids today. Here's a picture of me chewing them out. Like I don't, we don't do that. But that's a reality of my life that in a, in one-on-one, -on -one, which is where real community happens is face-to-face -face with people. That's where you can tell your friend, hey, I'm really sorry. Yeah, I, you know what, you're right, and I'm never gonna do that again. And you can, you can tell her, you know, hey, you know, I wish, I wish I was there for you two years ago. I wish that I could, have, I could have helped you. And that'll mean more to her than any argument that you can make about why abortion is wrong, because she's lived it. She knows why abortion is wrong. She has to think about it every single day. You don't have to make the argument for her. You really just need to comfort her. Thank oh, you. Thank you, yeah. Any, any other questions? What role do you think the government should play, potentially, in aiding mothers or families so that they're able to, like, equipped to take care for these children so they don't have to resort to abortion? Dr. Colossal? Yeah. <laughs> well, First of all, it is a tough question because we, we start with the argument of whether government should do a lot of things or whether the church and individuals should do a lot of things or some combination of the two that's balanced in some way. But I'll just take the question as it is. What should government do, assuming government should uh, do something, anything at all in this re respect? I think they can play a role in providing services to uh, mothers and to babies um, in various ways to help them find housing, to help them find community, to help them in health issues with the baby or with the mother, both. Uh, those kinds of things are legitimate. Uh, whether I'd, I'd rather have the church and individ Christian individuals doing that, because I would say, I would argue in general, they know better what's going on in their particular communities. They're better able to respond that way. But Dr. Harris did point out that we're often not really good about uh, behaving the way we should with regard to people who've had abortion, women who've had abortions. And we need to change our culture to be better at that before we can get away from government more. Uh, we, can, we can supplant government easily. Uh, and I think sometimes there's a place for it. There's a sort of a safety net, if you will. But I don't want to go too far with it. You end up creating massive bureaucracies that, that don't have any connection with what they're doing down here, and they also may tend to skew the particular um, arguments that they bring to the table when they're providing their services uh, against the culture of life, right, and for a culture of death. I, 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 susp I don't like that. That worries me that any time government gets involved, it would do that. So uh, there's a place. It's got to be very carefully used 
and I would prefer to have churches and Christian individuals involved in that, or other institutions, private institutions. Okay, thank you. You know, I'd just say it, it, it kind of resonates with uh, kind of an attitude we've heard from the panel in general, which is that um, institutional changes, the kinds that we're advocating for, are changes in the way that we as a people are talking about something that we say that we value, and the way we live, and so forth. And so it could be that you know appealing to an institution to make sure that that sort of faceless entity really cares about people and sees them as people is not going to be as successful as trying to get people to care about other people. That's right. yeah. um, and the church is supposed to be about that, and that's part of what it would mean to to kind of have the vocabulary that we've we've uh, have has been given to us in Scripture. Someone else, I saw someone stand and sit. Yeah. So in terms of challenging the scope or the view of abortion within institutions, wouldn't you, couldn't one argue that it's more important to first challenge their worldview or their presuppositions? Because if one holds different presuppositions than that of a Christian, they might ne not necessarily get to the same belief or idea that a Christian holds because their worldview or presuppositions don't allow them to. Uh, um, would you, could you care elaborate that just a little bit? So, in terms of if if one's a utilitarian, they don't necessarily hold the same view of a Christian. So they're right. not going to get to the same idea that a Christian would because their belief isn't based in, it's not based biblically. Okay. So you're asking then what, what role do political legal institutions right. have uh, to play? More so, would it, before we can address like the, the culture, institution, like, right, culturally, wouldn't it yeah. be more important to first address okay. the individual? Yeah, I, I don't think it's either or. I don't think it's a first and second. I think it's both and. Uh, Obviously, not every Christian is called to be involved in that. Uh, some people I wouldn't want to be involved in politics. We all have our predispositions to sin, and if we have a predisposition to things like pride and desire for glory and all this kind of thing, then we better not. But if we're prepared to do that, God calls us, we could, we could in, be involved in that at the same time that we're also, and other people are also involved in changing the culture uh, and the church itself. And likewise with the legal profession, there are people who are called to make really good arguments regarding abortion cases, and they should pursue that as well at the same time, I think, that we're pursuing the other avenues uh, apart from politics and law, uh, as we're called, right? Each one has different colleagues, and each one has uh, different kinds of strategies they would follow. And, and although I would prefer not to have to use the legal and political mechanisms at all, we have to in some cases, it's just the way it is, or else this culture can be imposed upon us by people who are considered the elites of culture, the intelligentsia of culture. Uh, the legal profession, for example, uh, the professional politicians, other people like that. So yeah, I think it's, it's, I think it's both and. I, w I would say that, that just, because, just because the, the complete solution begins at this institutional level that we're, that we're talking about. And again, by institution, I'm not, I'm not talking about government. I'm talking about us as a church re revitalizing ourselves. Um, but that doesn't mean the crisis isn't there. It, it, would, it would be like, you know, we, we see everything happening in the Ukraine right now. And it would be like saying that the solution to, to what's happening in the Ukraine is that we strengthen, that Ukraine strengthens relations with the EU. Um, and, and NATO. Uh, well, I mean, that would be good, but it's like a little too late for that at this point, right? That would have, that would have fixed it, you know, maybe, maybe a decade ago that we wouldn't be seeing what we're seeing, but we are seeing what we're seeing, so the war has to happen. So I don't want to speak about what we're doing in terms of war, but it certainly is a crisis. And so the crisis is here whether we like it or not, and so the work that's happening at like pregnancy health centers, uh, the, the, the court, the laws that are being passed by various states, that kind of thing, that has to happen, but it's not a final solution. The final solution to the problem of our culture of death is creating a culture of life. We, it's only a, it's only a band aid, until we do what, exactly what you're talking about. But it's both and. And let me let me try to make sure. So are are you possibly are some of are what you thinking like if. We try to address in an institution like education, like primary schooling, this issue. Could we deal with this issue without dealing with 
the presuppositions. Is that kind of right. what you're? That's what, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I would say there are some times where we can, and the reason why is uh, in order for me to get, like, say, a school to teach education perfectly the way I think it should be done, they would probably need to have a very similar worldview than me. But I can also argue against perspectives without them sharing my worldview. Because I can show the, the conflict of a perspective without actually having to change all of their presuppositions. So if I'm able to do that, like so for example with utilitarian thinking, I don't need to get someone to be a divine command theorist or what I am generally am or natural law theorist-ish. We're in this range. We're, in the, we're both in the middle between Aquinas <laughs> and Occam. Occam's a crazy person. No Aquinas is somewhere else. We're both generally in the middle. So. Uh, <laughs> But where, 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 we were, where we are, I don't need to get someone where uh, we are to show where utilitarian won't work in certain areas. And that's going to be enough for them to at least say, okay, well that means maybe in this institution I can't run it simply by running my utilitarianism. And, and part of the difficulty of us living in a pluralistic society where we have such public interchange with a lot of views is because we are going to have to agree on certain things in order for us to work. But we're also going to have to leave open the fact that we won't agree on everything. So what it might mean is that the way that we're going to influence those institutions is not primarily by trying to get a, a school to look more Christian in its presuppositions initially. It's going to be first to show negatively why these perspectives that are guiding it can't work. Here are some other ways that would probably work that we could agree upon that would prevent things like particular perspectives being proposed that we think are wrong. Does that make sense? That way I don't have to change a complete person's complete worldview without showing at least why some sections of their worldview are either inapplicable or wouldn't work enough for them to say, okay, maybe here I'm going to hold back on saying we should be teaching this in a school or something like that. But uh, I will say, and I, I feel confident speaking for the whole panel, that uh, conversion helps a lot. Thank you all for being here. My question is for Dr. Harris. Um, we often define ourselves in terms of what we're against rather than what we're for, and I think a lot of you have addressed this. Um, so how do we as Christians communicate in a way that's winsome, good, and attractive so that our speech is seasoned with salt and full of grace? What advice do you have? Well, first of all, so um, the previous gentleman, uh, gentleman uh, in the conversation, eventually the, the word pluralism was brought up. I don't remember who said what, but eventually it was brought up. And you, we need to remember that, that a pluralistic society, by definition, is living in a society where there are a whole lot of bad opinions, and hopefully also the right opinion in there somewhere. There's, because, because we can be certain of the truth of Christ, we have an opportunity to build in a way that others don't because we because we can have a real foundation so I'm trying to say, state your question one more time so I can make sure I'm going the right way with it right so begin with so begin with Christ begin with the idea that truth is a person and you can know him his name is Christ, and he gave us the template for living. And then try to live your life the way Christ would want you to live it, to follow him. Now, you will fail at that in some way every single day of your life. But you'll also get it right sometimes, and people will notice that. So you have to begin by being, being a person that people want to get to know. I think... A, I think of a, a lot of people that I've, I've known throughout the years, and they just want to start an argument. They just want to tell you why you're wrong. Rather than saying, hey, let me tell you, let me tell you what I learned today. I mean, how many, how many conversations start with that? Just let me share with you something that I learned. And it, which, which person do you want to sit down to have lunch with, right? Okay, the topic is this. What's your opinion? Let me tell you why you're wrong. Or hey, you know, how are you doing today? Tell me, tell, me, tell me how your life's going. And just begin by building, by building the right thing. Do we have to tear down sometimes? Yes. When, the, when someone comes 
at you with an argument, you have to be able to tear down their argument from the inside. And you have to do that with, with love, but with truth. It's normally in the form of a question. Socrates shows the way on that. But um, I think, the, I think it's, you're talking about communicating the truth. Start with the truth. Start with Christ. Live the truth. And then the truth was going to flow naturally out of you. And people will notice. And they will respect it even if they don't agree with it. I think related to that, um, and along the same line, uh, you're, it's difficult to engage on an issue that you have heard is the, where there's, this is the right perspective, these are the right words to say, if you don't believe it and it doesn't like echo in your life. You know? So uh, everybody could know, for example, in the room, uh, you know, you, you, you ought to be a witness for Jesus. And you, like, you could know that's the case, and you could like, maybe never share the gospel with anybody. And then it's actually somewhat difficult the first time you're trying to do that to share what you know you ought to do and so forth. It doesn't have any shoe leather yet, right? You just sort of have this belief that you know is right and you sort of cling to it, but maybe don't act on it. So we can say, hey, you could have the right kind of opinion, and the right opinion might be, this is a bad thing. But that doesn't necessarily express what you're for. And uh, Christianity is not just a negative religion. It's not just a list of things that we're not. It's also something we're about. And we're about proclaiming a particular kind of message and vision of an abundant life, which we get from Christ through grace. So I think the idea here is you approach this person as a person, like Dr. Harris is saying, and then you invite them into a conversation and not a diatribe. And I think that that, uh, that makes a big difference. Yeah, the, the truth is not the sum total of the facts. The truth is a way of life. what can we do, how can we create a culture that values life? And I think a lot of my question is just, you know, what does, what does that look like? What does it look like when young teens aren't looking for fulfillment in, you know, other people affirming them and having relations with them? Like, what does it look like when we have a culture and a world where we can stop the problem before it starts and also help to heal those who have already taken that step? So I'll, I'll, give an, I'll give an attempt at a kind of answer to that question and then you know, fill in. Uh, here's one idea. Uh, you could stop talking about children as if they're basically just bad and an imposition on your whole life and a threat to your happiness and wealth. Right? Um, it's, it's very hard to say to someone it would be really bad for you not to like, you know, have this child and raise them and do whatever else if Christian's own way of talking about our children is that they're basically an interruption to a good thing when they're not. Or we think about, you know, marriage is primarily something that husband and wife benefit from and man, there's these kids too. Um, so I, I think there's a real challenge with that is this, this idea of a culture of life is a celebration of the things that God gives us. If we're going to say that you, this woman, should welcome this child as a guest, we have to welcome children as guests. And so you can't have an attitude that you think other people ought to sort of have this posture towards folks, but I'm not going to, as if there's just a burden on other people to kind of uh, to, to love children. Um, that has to be something that, that characterizes uh, you know, our general perspective on what they're for. Um, they're, they're a good thing. A child is a good thing. So if we're going to make that advocacy, then we have to actually talk and act as if that's true. <clears throat> yeah, I think, too, we as churches have to think about how we need to, to minister and reorganize in, in those areas. I think there are certain areas where the church doesn't talk about it, even though we know it's a problem. We know it's a problem at that church, right? So if you think about it, how many churches have groups that deal with pornography? Because I guarantee you, probably 50% of that church probably is at least dealing with it. <laughs> it's a reasonable chance, right? I mean, most pastors now would say that's probably the biggest pastoral problem, and yet most churches don't have that. Why? Because it's an embarrassing thing, and we don't want people to find out that people deal with that issue. But that means there's a, a sin that is constantly going around that we're just not even ministering to. And so uh, in, in the issue of abortion, we just need to think, okay, how do we 
how do we speak the truth, but how do we speak the truth in love? How do we minister to people who've gone through it? We don't even think about those types of things. And that also means that our, we need to even just be preaching from the pulpit on how we develop as individuals and Christians the types of virtues necessary to minister well in these situations, be equipped uh, to dealing with those situations. I think we, uh, we also just as a church need to kind of similar the way we do it on an individual level where we kind of build relationships and then use that, we as the church needs to kind of, uh, we need to do what we say we believe. You know, so I, I went to a church, I visited a church and they talked about abortion and one of the things the pastor said is, I promise you if you're in this room and you're thinking about abortion, we will take your child. I guarantee if you call me, we will get your child, we will take your child. And that week, a girl called and said we were going, she was thinking about having an abortion, and within a few hours, three or four families said, we will take that child. Well, they, they put their money where their mouth was, right? It's like if you're a church, if you're willing to go through those types of things, I think we could have a really good ministry, but it's going to require a concerted effort for us to realize this is a big issue. Yeah. That's going to require a change of attitude in the churches, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, as you mentioned, these sins that we want to just hide because of... I'm not exactly sure what, what the cultural history of this is to know why we, we pick certain sins just to squash and hide and put, you know, put it away as if it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's there, and there are several of them, and we need to, to begin to uh, uh, talk about that openly in our churches. And I think it's our leadership that's going to have to start doing that. Another, mm -hmm. If it's not them, it's going to be others. It's going to have to be others in the church. Uh, make a little bit of a ruckus about it, maybe. <laughs> uh, graciously, hopefully. <laughs> In gracious some way, ruckus. A, a gracious, gracious ruckus. ruckus uh, yeah. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I, I think about the budget. I think about the budget of the church, the, like the, the missions budget. I, and I think missions is wonderful. And, and we need to support people who are in mission all over the world. But I think in the Great Commission, we often forget Jerusalem. We forget that, hey, you know, maybe, maybe we can have a missionary to our community right here in the form of of someone who, whose job it is to perhaps uh, run or, or be a part of a pregnancy care center or maybe even out of our own churches begin to start some sort of support mission for um, these mo young mothers who are in crisis. Thank you. Um, I, about nearly 30 years ago, graduated from college. Um, and I've invested the last two decades of my life plus into raising my children. And you talked about institutional mindset, and I think just going so basic to family of, I love, you know, kids need to stop being an interruption to our lives. Um, I think I have a, a quote that I love, that it's, it is better to raise whole children than to repair broken adults. And I think our and I'd like to just comment on this, but I think our lifestyle is so busy. We don't have the energy to, to discipline our children. We don't have the energy to raise them. Um, we don't, um, the little girls um, that grew up to be young women that are looking for love and having sex before marriage, um, they probably have pretty big daddy holes. And I, I think um, we need to stop looking at full-time motherhood as, wow, it's too bad you didn't use your BA better. Um, I invested the best that I have been, or the best that I am in my children, and I do not regret it one bit. It is worth it. And I'm going to be, and that, uh, I guess, graduating from full-time mommyship, you know, this year, I'm 50 years old. I've got years and years and years to do lots of different things. Like, what is God calling you to? Um, but if you have children, they're your ministry. If you're married, your spouse is your first ministry. And so I think the institution of we have to value and, and um, value our children and, and raise them whole as opposed to giving the best of ourselves um, other places. And so we've got broken kids that are making bad decisions because they're trying to fill holes that we should have filled for them. Um, and um, just, uh, speaking life to our children by how we invest in them. And then I think all of us today, you're not parents, probably many of you, but are we speaking life to the people around us? Are we, are we being kind in our words? Are we, um, are we building into people or are we tearing them down? 
Um, and, and in that, I think that builds a culture of life where you're a person that, you, that can be talked to. You know, if somebody was uh, uh, thinking about an abortion, you're a safe person to talk to, you're a safe person to go to. Um, I just, in my mind, it's, it's just, we have a busy culture that doesn't value children, and that is, the church is a busy culture that too many times kids are like, ugh. And do you see that as well? I think there's something to the idea that if you, uh, I was talking about some students this today actually, this is the time in the term typically when everyone is like, oh no, I've made terrible life decisions. <laughs> I've got 10,000 exams. Soon I will pass out. Um, <laughs> and uh, and th there's this sense that, uh, you know, we make a little plan in our date book. Well, that does tell us something about what we think is important, mm -hmm. the things that we wrote down in the date book, right? Um, and so likewise, you know, with the whole of your life, you could say, this is an issue that's really important to me, and that could mean whenever I get a chance to ask, ask, uh, talk about it and I've been invited to speak about it or it comes up at the next table, I shout a slogan. Or, or it could mean that I take some of the hours in my date book and try to get connected to, uh, to the issue. Mm -hmm. I, so I think that's true as a matter of family and the commitments that we make there, but I think that's true in our ministries in general, that um, if you think, I have an opportunity to serve in this particular capacity, then you've got to do that with your whole heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a worry that the kind of busyness of our day means that we've, we, we know maybe we ought to spend our time better, but we feel like it, we're not able to because of the clock or the calendar or something like that. But I, I like the point you made there about maybe seasons in our life. Your calling to follow the Lord is for your whole life. Right. And so your advocacy for this would be for your whole life. And that also means that if you've gotten it wrong at some stage, um, that's not irreparable. This is something that you could continue to work and grow in. So, if you have something you'd like to contribute? Uh, I, I was just gonna say, I, I agree with you. And I think for the, those who are college students out here, I know like right now, in your, in your mind, if you're thinking about it, you're, and you're thinking about romance, you're thinking about that, er, those, that early moment of your marriage when, you know, the honeymoon, right? Mm -hmm. You're thinking about that part of the marriage, um, the marriage relationship. And I'm going to tell you, it's a good part of the marriage relationship, <laughs> okay? But it's not the thing that sustains yeah. your marriage. And so, and, and, and it's, it's, there's going to be a moment, if that's all you're focused on, there's going to be a moment when even that wonderful good thing that God has given you just turns to ashes and is, means nothing to you anymore because, because love is not what our culture tells us it is. It is a sacrificial decision to, to take care of someone. And I'm not just talking about the men taking care of the women because let me tell you, Mrs. Harris takes care of me every single day. <laughs> And it's a hard job. I'm we sure. guard our husband's hearts. Yeah. yeah. We do. We yeah. guard our husband's it's hearts. It's true. And, and if, you, if you take one thing away from this conversation that we're having here, uh, it's that, is that the, the culture of life is one that goes somewhere. It's not just like, hey, we get to live and breathe. No, it's that you get to live in a certain way that leads to you drawing closer to God and therefore drawing closer to one another in your family, in your church, in your community, and beyond. Yes, thank you. Okay, well, we've gotten close to the, uh, the end of time here, so I'd like to close us with uh, a word of prayer. Um, the panels will be down front maybe after. If you have some questions, you can come and um, ask about that. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for its clarity, that it rewards our labor. Uh, we thank you for um, the gift of life that you've given us and for your clear moral instruction. And we ask that you would help us uh, to be witnesses to your goodness, to your glory, to your son, and that we would do this in a way uh, that you would have us do it, consistent with not just uh, the, f the facts of the case, but consistent with the kind of character that you want to form in each of us. Uh, we recognize our own frailty, the messiness of our world, its dysfunction, the challenges that uh, are beset us from every side to do that. We know that you are greater and that your son Jesus has overcome the world. 
and by the life that we have in him through his blood um, and the spirit that he has sent to be with us, that we can be your witnesses. So we ask that you would help us to do this work and to do it faithfully. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.